This is Your Morning Basket, where we help you bring truth, goodness, and beauty to your homeschool day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 23 of the Your Morning Basket podcast. I'm Pam Barnhill, your host, and thank you so very much for taking the time out to join me here today. We have a wonderful interview for you today. I got to talk to Kristen Ditchfield, who is the author of A Family Guide to Narnia. Now, we did talk about Narnia quite a bit, which was really fascinating. But also we talked about the power of literature to shape us and our children as people. I just really enjoyed getting to sit down and talk to Kristen about this. I think you guys are going to enjoy the conversation too. So we're going to get on with it right now. Kristen Ditchfield is a professional freelance writer, a conference speaker, and the host of the syndicated daily radio program, Take It to Heart. She is the author of numerous books, including A Family Guide to Narnia, a user-friendly resource intended to take the reader book by book through C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. In this book, Kristen illuminates the biblical truths and parallels that can be found throughout these classics. She joins us today to discuss how reading these books and others during morning time can help us turn our attention toward truth, goodness, and beauty as a family. Kristen, welcome to the program. It's great to be with you. Well, you know, many people approach the Chronicles of Narnia as allegorical. So could you kind of tell us what is allegory and do you think the Chronicles of Narnia actually falls into this category? Well, sure. You know, many people do refer to them as allegory or allegorical. Technically, from a, a literary standpoint, an allegory is a story in which every character and event, every detail is meant to be a symbol of something else. And it's meant to tell, you know, it's a story within a story. It's meant to tell another story. And there are allegorical elements in Narnia, but we wouldn't call the Chronicles of Narnia straight allegory or true allegory because it's not all allegory. There are some characters and events that do represent something else uh, that do have a deeper meaning. And then there are other characters and events and symbols that are just part of the wild, fun, imaginative world that C.S. Lewis created. And so if we try to look for hidden meaning in every single thing, every single aspect of the story, we'll just get a little confused and frustrated. He wasn't trying to write a Sunday school lesson or trying to write an allegory. He was writing uh, fairy tales. He was writing the kind of books that he wanted to read. And But unconsciously and, and consciously at times, he found himself writing stories that had a much deeper meaning, stories of faith stories that have touched millions of people for uh, generations now. And so we can look for those elements and we can be encouraged and inspired by them. And and millions of people have. Okay, that's interesting, because I know that Lewis himself was pretty adamant about the fact that Narnia was not allegory. Right. And that if maybe if it helps to give an example, Pilgrim's Progress is a true allegory. If you think about it, the main character is called Christian and Uh. the Christian. Right. And he goes on a journey and he makes progress and he runs into a giant called the giant despair. And what does that giant represent? He represents despair and discouragement (laughs) that we face in our Christian walk. Right. And so that's a true allegory because pretty much everything in that story is a symbol of what we encounter as Christians on our spiritual journey, whether he runs into a friend called hope, you know, And not all allegories are that overt, but they're written that way as a lesson, in essence, or some kind of moral fable or story. And that's not what Narnia is at all. But C.S. Lewis didn't disavow that there was a hidden meaning, that there were stories within the stories. In fact, one of my favorite things, he wrote a letter to a little girl. You know, he talked about Aslan having another name in one of the stories. A little girl wrote to him and she asked him, what's Aslan's other name? And he wrote her a letter. He said, well, I want you to guess. Has there ever been anyone in this world, and here he references uh, things from the story, he said, who arrived at the same time as Father Christmas, said he was the son of the great emperor, gave himself up for someone else's fault to be jeered at and killed by wicked people, came to life again, and is sometimes spoken of as a lamb. Don't you really know his name in this world? Think it over and let me know your answer. Mm. Uh, So he did acknowledge that the lion came bounding in, as he called it. Aslan, the great lion in his stories, 
is a representation of Jesus. And Jesus came into his stories and filled them. And he openly acknowledged that and other symbolism all the way through. But they aren't, he was a literature professor, so he wasn't going to use the term allegory either because it's not quite technically correct. Okay, great. Okay, so you referenced Narnia earlier as a fairy tale. Is that how you would categorize it? Well, as a, in the genre of literature, it's fairy tale or fantasy literature, yes. You know, they're fabulous stories, imaginative, full of um, characters that don't appear in real life, as opposed to, say, you know, contemporary literature that are stories that could happen, you know, right now in our world in 21st century America. They have characters like fawns and giants and their castles and their dragons and their, you know, all these kind of fairy tale elements. So in the genre of literature, it falls into fairy tale or fantasy. Okay. Well, okay. I'm going to stop pop quizzing you on whether or not (laughs) Narnia is allegory or fairy tale. Let's talk a little bit about some of the meanings behind not only Narnia, but some other stories that we might read as well. So what was your own childhood experiences with Narnia? How did those stories shape you? Well, you know, an aunt sent me a set of the Chronicles of Narnia when I was a little girl. Uh, my family read them later. We enjoyed them together and we enjoyed some of the audio versions on road trips together. But for me, I read them when I was about seven years old and I was a voracious reader. And I read the entire series, um, book after book after book. And then I read them again and again until they fell apart. I just love them. You know, we all find books that speak to us and grab hold of us. And for me, the Chronicles of Narnia were those books. And right away, as a little girl, I recognized from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the story where Aslan lays down his life and dies for a sinner and is raised from the dead in power and glory. I recognized that as Jesus right away. And so then I began to see in some of the other stories where he did and said things that were a lot like Jesus, too. But, you know, what really struck me is that many years later, as a young adult, I would try to think I'd be in a situation in my life and I would try to think, what would Jesus do? You know, Mm -hmm. what's the biblical principle that would apply to this situation? You know, what would God have me do? And I would be kind of running the database in my mind, trying to think, is there a scripture about this situation? And every so often I'd settle on a scene from Narnia. Something from Narnia would pop up and I would be embarrassed kind of, you know, in my mind. I'd be like, oh, oops, that shouldn't have come up. (laughs) That's not scripture. You know, and then after a while, I decided, wait a minute, that keeps happening. Let me stop and think about it. Why do I keep thinking of Narnia when I mean to look for a scripture? And as I settled in on it and I thought about that scene or that situation, I realized that it was right out of scripture. It was a parallel to that scene, that conversation that God had with Cain. It was a parallel to that scripture from Proverbs. It was an exact, you know, almost word for word from what happened with King Nebuchadnezzar or whatever. And I realized that it wasn't just the lion, the witch in the wardrobe that was full of scripture, but all seven books were full of scriptural references. And so I realized how much of an impact the Chronicles of Narnia had, how much Lewis's writing had, how many of those biblical principles and scriptural truths had sunk deep into my heart through these fairy tales, through these stories, you know, just as I read them and enjoyed them. And I wasn't studying them. I wasn't looking for symbolism. I wasn't uh, really meditating on them, but because I read them so many times, um, those truths were anchored in my heart. And then I began to understand them in a deeper way. Okay, so what would you say to a parent who was concerned maybe about some of the magical elements in Narnia or who felt like, you know what, we should be going straight to scripture for this stuff? Why would we use a book like Narnia instead of going straight to the Bible for this kind of instruction? Okay, well, let me, if I can answer that in two parts, why would you use Narnia instead of going straight to the Bible? Well, you don't have to, but Narnia is a powerful way. There are a lot of books and whether it's Narnia or other types of literature, God's inspired a lot of creativity. He's given a lot of people gifts to tell stories. And stories are a powerful way to communicate truth. In fact, Jesus spoke in parables. One of the gospels said he didn't speak anything without telling a story. In everything, he spoke in parables because stories are a great way to communicate truth and to wrap it up in such a way that it's memorable and that it sinks in and that we grasp it in a much deeper level. And sometimes we don't even understand it fully until years later, but we grasp it at the level where we're at. And then later, we understand even more and more of that truth. So I think God has given us literature. He's given us poetry. He's given us art. He's given us music. These are all 
ways that he speaks truth into our life. So whether it's Narnia or some other type of literature, I think those are, you know, books are powerful tools and it would be unwise not to take advantage of all that he's given us to use anything that we can use to communicate truth to our young kids we want to do. And then second of all, the concern about magic and fairy tales. I don't discourage any parent from having concerns about that. I think you should be concerned because there is a lot of literature out there that is not so great. There is a reason to be concerned about magic and fairy tales because there is an element of some types of fantasy literature that are connected with the occult. There are some kids who are more drawn to the occult than others. Many people don't even really enjoy fantasy literature. They can't really get into it. Some people even tell me because they know I've written some books about Narnia. They're like, ah, I could never get into those books. I'm sorry. They're embarrassed to say, (laughs) Uh, you know, some people just don't like it. Okay. But some people really are drawn to fantasy literature. And when they go from one series to another, to another, and they're going to find stuff on the shelves at the bookstore that is not only not Christian, but that is anti-Christian stuff that's full of pornography, that's full of profanity, that's full of occult symbolism and paganism and other things that are not desirable. And so, yeah, a parent should be concerned. And what you do, first of all, you recognize that you want to look for authors whose worldview is one that you value and respect. You want to look for authors with a biblical worldview. You want to say, is the good in this book really good? And is the evil really evil? Are the values and the things in this book, you know, is magic represented in a way that is God honoring? or not. You want to know a little bit about the author, about the storyline, but you also want to know a little bit about your kids and you want to teach them discernment and teach them right from wrong and teach them to be aware of, you know, the literature, like I shared with my story, literature does impact you. What you read does impact you. So be aware of that and do what, what God leads you to do for your family. Okay. I like that. Your answer is let's take a look at the worldview of the author and see if that is, you know, something that lines up with what we're trying to teach our children. And then we can feel more confident about what they're reading, even if it does contain some of these fantasy elements. And you know, what I love about C.S. Lewis, some of the elements like witchcraft and so on, some of the magical elements, first of all, some of it is very classical literature there. It's the mythology and the classical literature that they're going to be exposed to as they get older in school and education. It's part of world culture and history but also that he presents it from a very biblical point of view. I think most of us, regardless of our views on other book series, and I won't comment on, you know, I know we all have different views, but at least in C.S. Lewis, you know, there's no such thing as a good witch. Witches are always evil and they're always put to death, which is very biblical. You know, there's no confusion about who you should worship or about what you should do. There's right and there's wrong. There's God, there's truth. There's the light side or the dark. And the light is Jesus and God and truth. And the dark is self-serving and evil and, and occult. And it's very clear. The lines are drawn very clearly. So, you know, that helps me. And I know that's been a help to a lot of other parents as well. Great. Well, thank you. Well, you mentioned earlier that you kept going back to these truths that you had learned through Narnia as you came up against specific situations in your life. And you said that you kept coming back to these because you had read them over and over again. So I want to talk a little bit about how we kind of should approach this type of literature with our children as we're maybe reading aloud to them in morning time or as a family. So do we have to hit them over the head with it? No, I think that'd be a big mistake. (laughs) You don't want to sit there and kind of uh, pound it, you know, take the story and just pull it apart. And I think that first of all, we want to teach kids to love reading and to love a good story and to enjoy it. I think they'll get it. I think they will get it just from the story itself. You can read it and just enjoy it together. Maybe ask a few open-ended questions. Make sure they understand what they're hearing, what's happening in the story. Who are your favorite characters? What do you think is going to happen next? And then maybe out of that very natural conversation about the plot or about the characters, pick one or two points to kind of say, well, you know, did that remind you of anything? You know, that kind of reminds me of a Bible verse. You know, that reminds me of something that we were reading in our devotion the other day. Weren't we talking about that in Sunday school? Weren't you asking me to pray for a friend who was struggling with that? You know, there's a very natural way that in Deuteronomy, it says, talk about these truths with your children as you walk, as you talk, as you sit As you walk along the road, you know, talk about them very naturally as a part of your everyday life. And if you can just pick one or two points and just kind of work it into the conversation, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Okay. So I don't have to like make a worksheet between 
this happening in Narnia and this Bible verse and have them like draw lines and match them up or anything like that? Not unless you're doing it as curriculum. And I... <laughs> I have done, I have written some of that kind of curriculum. (laughs) I used to be a teacher, so I have had the privilege of doing that kind of curriculum and there's nothing wrong with that, but you don't have to. I think if you want to just do it as family time in the morning, as story time, you should just enjoy reading the story together and just ask a few conversational questions. Well, how should our, or should it, our approach change as our children get older? If I'm rereading Narnia with my kids when they're older, you know, maybe we read it for the first time when they were six or seven, and then we read it a little later. Should I try to draw out those ideas a bit more? You could definitely. And you might ask them if they notice anything, if they find any parallels, if it reminds them of anything scriptural, you could ask them more directly. And you could tell them, you know, you know, now you recognize now that there's some biblical truth here. What does it remind you of? Or how do you, you know, what is that? What connections do you find there? You can maybe point out, make an observation yourself. And then ask them if they see anything. Another thing you can do is if you have younger children is you can give the responsibility to the older children to take charge of story time and to teach something from it. Say, I'd like you to lead the conversation today. So we're going to read this chapter and I'd love for you to ask a few questions and see if you can find something in this chapter that we could talk about as a family some interesting plot point or some symbolism or something and give them an opportunity to kind of lead the conversation. Oh, that's a great idea. So it's, we still go back to that open-ended questioning and good conversation over anything else. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you can, it helps if you do a little bit of homework, you know, and I know we're all so busy and it's hard to do it, but if you can take a few minutes to kind of read a summary of the, if you don't have time to read ahead, read a summary of the book. Now, thank God for the internet, you know, or for books and resources that we have, but read a plot summary so that you know at least where the story is going. Read a little bit about the author. If you can look up a little bit of, you know, maybe what are the scriptures in or like the book that I've written is a guide just for families for that purpose is to kind of highlight what are some of the scriptures. And so you just have an idea of where you can take it. Where could I go if the opportunity arises and then pray for those teachable moments? I mean, I think maybe that's the biggest thing is to pray and ask God to give you eyes to see and ears to hear. Where's a teachable moment that I could lead this conversation that will have an impact on my child? Because that's what you're really looking for is an opening in which to have a conversation about a bigger life issue, about something spiritual that will have an impact on them for eternity. Oh, I love that because, you know, if I'm trusting in the Holy Spirit to lead my homeschool, it takes some of the pressure off of me. Yes, yes. (laughs) And he's so good about that. You know, he knows exactly what they're struggling with. He knows what's in their hearts. And, you know, we don't have to have all the answers and we don't have to try and figure it all out. He knows and he can lead us and guide us even when we're not aware of it. Well, you referenced your book, A Family Guide to Narnia. So let's just go ahead and take a few minutes to talk about what's in there and how might parents use that to, you know, kind of better experience the books, the series as a family. Sure. You know, this book actually came out of my teaching experience. I was working with a homeschool co-op and they asked me if I would teach a the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to a group of middle school boys. And I was reading this story with them. And every time we got to the end of the chapter, there was a teachable moment. I was surprised how into the story they were. I kind of thought they were going to blow it off, but they were really interested in the story. And there were so many times when it was perfect for conversation, their hearts were open, they were engaged. And I wanted to say, you know, doesn't that remind you of of the scripture? Doesn't that remind you? But I couldn't think like where that scripture was. I wanted to be able to quote it, but was that Jesus or was it Paul? I know it was somewhere in Genesis. I can't remember, was it that, you know, was it Cain and Abel? Was it, I couldn't think of, I couldn't put my finger on. I knew it was biblical, but where was it, you know? And it wasn't a good time to say, hold that thought while I go look for my concordance. This was before smartphones. So I was like, <laughs> before what Google. I, yes, exactly. What could I do? And I thought, I just wish there was like a cliff notes of biblical principles so that, you know, you could just have it really quick and be prepared. And so through a very long circuitous journey, I um, had the privilege of kind of doing this for a family, uh, for families through the Chronicles of Narnia to go chapter by chapter and book by book through the whole series and just look and say, OK, what are the biblical principles here? What are the parallels? Where does it directly parallel something in scripture? Um, where is it an exact almost word for word quote? And where is, you know, if I wanted to make a teaching moment out of it, what could I do? Where's something in this chapter that that references a scriptural principle? 
Where their symbolism that C.S. Lewis and other scholars have identified that that's very clear. This is a symbol of the stone tablets that Moses came down from the mountain. This is a symbol of the cross. Where are the ones that are sort of, you know, we could guess or think about or make a connection ourselves and put it together for parents, for teachers, so that you could just flip through really quickly, read through, get a summary of the story and read through and kind of take a few points and then just be ready so that when you have story time, you've got those points in mind, whether it's before bedtime or first thing in the morning or in the car, and you can have those teachable moments, those conversations together. So that's what I did. The parallels, the principles, a little bit of trivia, one page per chapter, because, you know, goodness knows, and you don't have to do every chapter, but if you have a little bit of information, then it can be really helpful to help you be prepared. Oh, it sounds extremely handy. Well, we've talked a lot about Narnia. So what are some examples of other works of literature that contain this kind of deep symbolism or have the potential to introduce our children to important truths? Do you have any others you like? Oh, goodness. You know, uh, there are so many great works of literature that have, I mean, pretty much all literature has symbolism because and this comes back to something you mentioned earlier, you know, the author's worldview. Every author writes a story with intention. They all have a purpose. Every author has a message. They have something on their heart that they want to say. It might be something we agree with or disagree with, something that we value or don't value, but they have a message. They have a theme. There's something they're trying to communicate. So all of literature is rich with symbolism. And so especially classic literature, you can kind of find a lot of resources. But I'm thinking even of like um, like a Christmas carol. That's a great mm-hmm. one to do together as a family because you've got Scrooge and his rebirth and his redemption. But there's all kinds of power in stories of forgiveness, in stories, I'm trying to think of some of the good ones for kids, but it kind of depends on the ages of your kids and what their interests are. I always look for ways to capture their interests. So what kinds of things, if they're interested in horses, then we go with these kinds of stories. If they're interested in an adventure, then these types, but pretty much every story that you read, I mean, there's some kind of symbolism in there. There's some kind of worldview and you can talk about what are these characters doing? Why do you think they're doing that? Where do you think they're going next? How does this, how do we feel about that? What do we think about that? And draw connections there. And that's why stories are so great. Well, you know, one of the things that Augustine says is that as educators, we should work together on ordering the affections of our children towards like truth, goodness, and beauty. So do you think reading literature can help us do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's fundamental and it's vital. And there's another thing about literature in that it it opens our mind and it helps us experience the world and it teaches us about other cultures, other countries, other people's lives and experiences, other eras in history. And this is important because if we're going to understand other people, I believe God's called all of us. Um, you know, Jesus called us in the Great Commission to be his witnesses. And we're all called to be effective in communicating the gospel. And in order to communicate the gospel, we have to be able to relate to and understand other people. And we can't just stand there and scream at them shout Bible verses, we need to be able to relate to them and to understand them and to communicate effectively, to communicate with grace, right? And sometimes Mm -hmm. I run into people whose world is so very small, their life experience is all they know, growing up on their street, in their city, in their church, in their community, and they don't understand that anybody else's life is different than their life. They don't understand that anybody else's experience is different than their experience. And they have a very hard time connecting with people at work connecting with people in other cities and other other environments, because really, they just don't understand that anybody lives a different kind of life than they do. And if you're going to be an effective witness, an effective minister, you have to understand that people have different lives. Well, most of us can't go out and live all of these other lives, and we wouldn't want to. We don't need to have some of the negative experiences that other people have. We don't want to live through some of the pain and the suffering and the heartache that other people have to go through. But reading their stories can help us understand them better. Reading their journeys, even if it's fictional, reading about other cultures, reading about other people's sufferings and trials, especially, you know, you read these stories that take place in different wars, in different places, in history and eras, help us understand the human experience and help us connect and relate, realize the world is so much bigger than us, so much bigger than our experience and help us understand other people's suffering and other people's lives so that we don't have to make the same mistakes that they've made and we can be more compassionate and we can be more effective ministers of the gospel. Oh, I just, I love that. (laughs) (laughs) 
so often we think of stories as just, you know, entertainment or, you know, something you might learn a lesson from, as we were talking earlier, that, you know, we could learn these kinds of lessons from the stories that we read. But, you know, it sounds like one of the greatest lessons that we can learn from a story is compassion for fellow humans or even empathy for others. Yes, just learning what other people's lives are like and that it's not all the same as ours. You know, we can walk through a story, we can experience what it's like to be an orphan arriving on Ellis Island in the uh, 17 or 1800s, I guess. We can learn what it's like to live through World War II and to be a nurse driving an ambulance or to be a soldier on the front. We can learn what it's like to be a soldier in the Civil War. We can learn, you know, we can read these different stories. And we can experience history and we can experience different things like grief or pain or loss or battles and overcome. We can learn about courage. We can learn what it is to stand up for something and to fight for something that you believe in. We can learn what it means to overcome adversity. We can learn what it means to develop your gifts and talents. I mean, reading these fictional stories or, you know, many of them are based in history or based, you know, biographies or things like this. But they can teach us so much about the world around us and teach us about life. And so I think God's given us a wealth of knowledge and understanding that we can gain. And as well as entertainment, there's nothing wrong with reading for entertainment. There's nothing wrong with appreciating the beauty and the joy that reading gives us. But there's also a, another purpose there. And, and that's why I, you know, I'm glad to see kids reading um, and I encourage families to read and you know, the more that we can share these stories, the more it gives us compassion and understanding for the people in our lives. That's just great. Well, Kristen, if people want more information about A Family Guide to Narnia or about you and your other work, where can they find you online? Uh, probably the easiest place is my website and blog. It's kristenditchfield.com. And my parents spelled my name funny. Um, when I was a little girl, they wanted to make sure it had Christ in it. So that's how my name is spelled, Christ in, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N, Kristen Ditchfield, just like a ditch and a field. So it's kristenditchfield.com. Okay, and we will include a link to that in the show notes for this episode. So if somebody wants to click through, it'll be really easy for them to find. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I do appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. And there you have it. Now for the basket bonus for today's episode, we have gone through and collected up a number of the open-ended questions that Kristen used throughout the episode and kind of modeled for us to ask of our children. And we've made you a handy printable of these open-ended questions to slip right into your morning time binder and use with just about every story that you read. So we have that for you. You can get that and links to all of the resources and books that Kristen and I talked about today, including her family guide to Narnia, her own website where you can get more information about her and her syndicated radio show as well. So you can find all of that at edsnapshots.com forward slash YMB23. And also over there, we have instructions on how to leave a rating or review for the Your Morning Basket podcast on iTunes, just in case you were so inclined to do so. And for those of you who have already left a rating or review, we just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to do that. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another great interview. Until then, keep seeking truth, goodness, and beauty in your homeschool day.